Good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Before we open um, the scriptures together in uh, Jones' study from 1893, can we begin with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this past week, for the trials of it, for the struggles that we have faced in living in this world of sin and suffering. Uh, the pain that we have felt and um, the conviction that your Holy Spirit has brought to our hearts and the things that you have revealed to us in our studies, both as a group and personally. And we are thankful, Lord, that you still are merciful to each one of us. We ask, Lord, that as we look at these things, uh, this evening, that your Holy Spirit can be here to instruct us, to correct us, and to bring about the work that you want to do in each one of our hearts as we seek to minister to others, and especially to each other in this movement. Give us wisdom and understanding. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening again, and happy Sabbath. Now, uh, this study is number 11 of Jones, the third angel's message, given in 1893. Now, um, this chapter I remember really well from when I read it the first time. So I would have first read the 1893 General Conference Bulletin back in the late 80s, um, not sure which year, whether it was, I think it was probably 86 or 87. And, um, and, and I read it again, you know, actually a few times, but the last time I would have read it would have been probably in, in the nineties somewhere. Um, but this, this, this uh, sermon of his, I remember quite well. And um and a lot of these are ones that that hit me pretty hard back then. Um, the thing that's interesting is how much how much of it is new, in the sense that I didn't understand what he was talking about, or I didn't make the connections that we now can make. So as we examine the scriptures, as we examine messages that God's servants have given in the past, because our experience has grown, because we've been through. Uh, different experiences some things will strike us that we we just didn't notice in passing so we're going to begin you know i i find this a little bit difficult reading so much i'm not really a fan of listening to somebody read something i try to do the best that i can but if you do have a comment if you have a question um feel free to stop me at any time. And um, for those who are watching this um, after it's recorded, it'd be very nice that people put notes or comments in the video itself. I don't get too many notes or comments in the videos. But if somebody has a question, especially, um, it's much nicer to have it in the comments in the video so that other people who might have the same question can have it answered. If, if I can possibly answer it. <clears throat> you mean like on Facebook? Yeah, well, on, I, well I, I prefer YouTube because then everybody who clicks on it will see it. If you do it on Facebook, it'll only be in that Facebook group. If you do it on YouTube, then anybody who goes to that video, no matter which Facebook page they go from, which group they go from, they will see the same comment. So thanks All for right. that. The place where we were in the scriptures, you remember, in this series of lessons is that counsel of the true witness, the second thing that he tells us to buy. We studied the first the other night. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. That was our study, the last lesson. Our study tonight begins with the next thing. I counsel thee to buy of me white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. 
And then he asks a series of questions, which he gets these response from the congregation. So he says, what is that raiment? Righteousness. Whose righteousness? Christ. Whose is that? The righteousness of God. Whose are we to seek? The righteousness of God. What is righteousness? Right doing. Is righteousness right doing? Yes. All thy commandments are righteousness. What are they to us? What do they say? Do. Do they? The commandments require doing, do they? Congregation says, yes, sir. The first of all the commandments is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Righteousness is right doing then. That's plain enough. Whose righteousness are we to seek? Congregation says God's righteousness. Who are we to have? God's. Whose right doing are we to have? Christ's. But whose right doing is in Christ? God's. Christ did not do anything of himself. He says, of mine own self, I can do nothing. John 5, verse 30. Whose right doing do we find in Christ? God's. God was in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Whose right doing are we to have? God's. Now, is that so? Yes, sir. Will you stick to that for a week? Yes, sir. Elder William Hutchinson said, for life. All right. But if some people in this audience will stick to that for a week, I shall be happy. And so will they. Because there are some here who are not sticking to it at all. They haven't it. They don't know it. And there are many, a good many of them too. And for that reason, we want clearly to understand as we start, what kind of raiment is it that we are to buy? that we are after, whose right doing is it that we are to have? The congregation says God's. Whose righteousness are we to seek? That is what we are to find out in this. That is what we are to find out in this lesson. Um, now, this is, of course, an important point because uh, Jones, even though his writings are often used to support the idea of the in Christ motif, um, if anybody has ever read any books that promote that, we can see that that's not what Jones is promoting. That they what is the uh, Christ motif? What is that? The idea is that that the righteousness exists in Christ alone; that it doesn't have to exist in our own life. <clears throat> I see. So, if we're in Christ, His righteousness is given to our account. It uses a lot of the language that Jones uses. But it gives it a different meaning. And that's often one of the, of the best ways, if you want to promote error, is to just change the definitions of meanings of words so that um, a phrase just means something different. Because language is meant to communicate. So if you want to confuse people or put people off track, is you just change the meaning of things. So I remember in the Nature of Christ study back in the 90s and the 80s, um, it was pretty clear that, you know, that Christ was, um, you know, based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, that he had a fallen human nature, a sinful human nature. But of course, we know Christ didn't sin. So some people started adopting this idea of taking one of Ellen White's statements about the sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. And what does she mean by the sinlessness of the human nature of Christ? Does she mean that Christ had a sinless human nature? Or does she mean that Christ had a human nature, like you and I have a fallen human nature, but that he was sinless? So in that sense, it's the sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. That is Christ in human nature, which is fallen human nature, did not sin. So, so people were taking that and twisting the meaning of Ellen White's words. And uh, doesn't doesn't Desmond Ford do that? Yeah. Is, uh, is two atoms? 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing about language is it's as much as we try to be precise, I mean, there's lots of different meanings to the same word. Another example of that, when, you know, Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. And that word perfect can be translated as the word mature. So people would say, well, what we need is spiritual maturity, but we're not expecting to have a perfect character. And then they define the word uh, perfect in, in another way. So when they will talk about perfectionism, like nobody's perfect. Well, so on the one hand, they use the meaning to mean maturity. On the other hand, they mean used to mean sinlessness. So this creates a great deal of confusion when you're trying to communicate with someone who doesn't want to stick to a definition of a word or will use it in one sense one time and then in another sense another time. But, but anyway, um, we can see here that this righteousness of Christ is something that we need to seek, but it has to become a part of our life. It's not something that's just in Christ. It is in Christ because that's where we find it. But it, we, we can't leave it there, right? If it's just in Christ, that's not going to do anything to save us. We have to be in Christ. And to be in Christ means to have his character. So that righteousness that we have when we're in Christ is still Christ righteousness, but it's now worked out in the life. So it, Jeff had a Jeff had a book out um, dealing with that. I think it had he was when he was talking about the um, beyond belief. Yeah, and the yeah. new view. He had a book. Yeah, yeah. I, well, yeah. So this was part of the issues way back in the nineties uh, with um, Jack Sakira and the book Beyond Belief. Yeah. So I read Jeff's book. But, but I'd read the book Beyond Belief back then as well, knowing that it was error. Um, and that's the misuse of Jones and Wagner, which um, Wheeland and Short, who were the 1888 Message Study Committee, and we're going to look actually at um, Robert Wheeland's, some of his stuff, and Donald K. Short's uh, book, Then Shall the Sanctuary Be Cleansed. Um, in these studies so we're gonna we're gonna get there when we get there whenever that will be but um <clears throat> you know the problem is this misuse of language and it's uh, the one thing you never want to do to win an argument is to uh win an argument by being um by not communicating clearly to get somebody to agree with you in word, but not in reality. And I mean, you should never really seek to try to get somebody to agree with you anyway. You should just speak plainly, speak the truth, and allow people to make their choices, to respond to truth. If you use deceit, um, you're not really winning them over. Uh, you're not promoting truth. But people often think that that's what they need to do. But anyway... It's sort of an aside um, from here, <clears throat> but we want to know what righteousness we are to seek. Now, calling attention again to a thought that we have studied before, with which to begin this study tonight directly, that is, what this righteousness is to us now, let us turn back to the passage in Joel, the second chapter and the 23rd verse. And notice also the marginal reading. Be, ye, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain. Our study on that was in bulletin number seven, page 183. What is the margin? He hath given you the former rain. What is that? A teacher of righteousness. So that's what the word um, former rain in the marginal reading. So um, now the question is, how do we get that? How, I mean, they look like quite different words. Um, former rain and teacher of righteousness.
I mean, and the first time I'd ever heard this was from Jones. I'd never, um, So the word that means uh, former rain is this word mora. It means an archer, also teacher or teaching. Now, I mean, we know here it's, it's talking about the former rain, but why would the former rain be why would they use a word that also means teacher or teaching? Well, don't we have to be, I mean, most of us have to be taught something before we can be expected to act upon it. Okay. So if, if we look at the primitive root, yura, it means properly to flow as water, right? So that's why we, we deal with this as rain, right? But this is talking specifically the word that's translated as former rain. Uh, transitively, it means to lay or throw, especially an arrow that is to shoot, figuratively to point out as if by aiming the finger that is to teach. Um, so it's, it's to point out something. So then it means then it's translated often as archer, cast, direct, inform, instruct, lay, show, shoot, teach, teacher and teaching. Um, so Angelus wants to look at Isaiah 55 verse 10 and 11. And so for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth the bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing where, whereto I sent it. So one of the things we can see here is the former rain is the rain that happens after you plant the seed. And if we think about um, this former rain and the latter rain, the former rain uh, after the seed is planted, it's going to cause it to, to, to germinate, right, to grow up. But in order for there to be a harvest, you need the latter rain. And so we can see here in this former and latter rain is this idea that in the former rain, we are instructed, but in the latter rain, we are teachers, right? Does that make sense to people what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand that. Okay. Okay, so... Um, go on here um, so this is the teacher of righteousness he hath given you a teacher of righteousness according to righteousness was that the former rain now now why is it a teacher of righteousness according to righteousness what why does he why is it said that way So it says he's given you the former rain moderately. Um, and that could, word is, could it mean so, sorry, Theater, could it mean somebody who not only preaches the word and knows the word in, 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 in an intellectual fashion, but actually lives it? Okay. Yeah. So this teacher of righteousness has to be righteous. Now it says the former rain, and the word it uses here is moderately in the King James, uh, but the Hebrew word sedaka means rightness, virtue, uh, rectitude, justice, 
um, and that's objectively justice, morally virtue, or figuratively prosperity, justice, moderately right, righteous. So, so when it says the former reign, which is a teacher of righteousness, according to righteousness, that is moderately, God sends forth this rain and he will cause to come down for you. Um, the, the rain, right? So that's the word geshem, that means a shower. The former rain, morah, and the latter rain, malkosh, which means the spring rain. So it's just the rain in the spring that har har uh, ripe for the harvest to ripen. Uh, and then in the first month, so month being added. So that's, that's what the verse says. But that's why it's a teacher of righteousness according to righteousness. And, of course, this means that um, to be taught, to receive the for former reign, the, the thing that I'm looking at here is we have the first, second, and third angels' messages. And... Many people look at the third angel's message as righteousness by faith, but they don't recognize that you need righteousness by faith all along. So the first angel's message is righteousness by faith. The second angel's message is righteousness by faith. But the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. That is, in reality, it's when that righteousness has been worked out completely in the life and we can see that the former reign in some ways can be analogous to the first angel's message and the latter reign to the second angel's message would we agree with that Yeah, thanks, so. I mean, it, it's not it's it's not as simple as that, but we know that there is. In order for you to receive the latter rain, you need to receive the former rain, right? If you didn't have any former rain, would the latter rain do you any good? No. 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 Same with the first and second angels' message. If you hadn't received the first angels' message. The second angel's message won't do you any good. If you rejected the first, you cannot be benefited by the second. So, so that's why I say they're analogous. Okay. <clears throat> so, so the former reign moderately. What is moderately? He says, what was the former reign at Pentecost? A teacher of righteousness. He hath given you a teacher of righteousness according to righteousness. Was that the former reign? And he will give you the reign, the former reign and the latter reign. Is that the first? What will the latter reign be? A teacher of righteousness again. According to what? Righteousness. Again. According. Uh, according. Yeah. So uh, I guess I skipped a line there. Or double the line. Anyway, but what is another expression for the latter rain? Congregation says the outpouring of the spirit. What is another one? The times of refreshing. What is the latter rain to the third angel's message? Congregation, the loud cry. And what is the latter rain in connection with the fall of Babylon? It is the bestowal of that power and that glory with which the angel of revelation comes down and lightens the earth. Now, here, just looking at how we understand the lines in Millerite history. So the Millerites give the first angel's message. Now, prior to the close of the first message, before the arrival of the second, they believe that they're giving um, the midnight cry from the parable of the ten virgins. But the true midnight cry is given after April 18th. Even though Samuel Snow studies it prior, it's going to be given after April 18th. And, of course, it's going to be formalized at Boston and empowered at Exeter. But we can see that it's connected with the midnight cry. And Ellen White compares the midnight cry to the loud cry. And that the loud cry comes after the arrival of the second angel. 
And in, in Millerite history, the second angel arrives April 19th. In our history, the second angel arrives at 9-11. So we know that Jeff marks 9-11 as the first sprinkling of the latter rain, correct? <clears throat> yes, I remember right. Yeah. Yeah. And and he's seen what, what that is, is this understanding that's coming to the movement, to the way that um, the message is just growing and developing. But the third angel's message, because if if the former rain is the first angel's message and uh the latter rain is the second angel's message. We know, of course, that the loud cry comes after the Sunday law, right? In our, our, our lines, the way that Jeff has lined this up is the midnight cry comes before the Sunday law. And we, we've dealt this with this before, how Jeff ended up coming to this conclusion. Um, but we, what we didn't realize is that the midnight cry in our line is typical of the loud cry on the big line. That is that Ellen White's comparison of the midnight cry to the loud cry still holds when we look at her line. So in her line, she has a repeat of history. She has the second angel, um, uh, the, the second angel arriving again in Revelation 18, coming to join the third angel right? And we call that the other angel, sometimes the fourth angel, but it's the second angel's message. So if we're going to look at the third angel's message, what is its relationship then to the former reign and the latter reign? If the latter reign is the second angel's message and the former reign is the first angel's message, what is the third angel's message? What does it mean when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down and empowers the third angel's message? You understand the question? Okay, what was that? Didn't catch what you said. Could you repeat it, please? The question? Okay, so we said that the first angel's message is the former reign, that it, it, it parallels that. And the second angel's message is the latter reign because it comes after the first angel's message in Millerite history, right? If, if we're gonna compare those two. But then we know that we're in the time of the third angel. Now, when the third angel comes, it arrives October 22nd, 1844. Now we're in the time of the third angel, but the second angel comes again and joins the third angel. So the question is, if the first angel's message is the former reign and the second angel's message is the latter reign, what is the third angel's message? Come out of her, my people. Well, we know that it has to do with the harvest, right? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And and so, and I'm not saying that this is, is, is the best way to explain it. But when we say that the third angel's righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in Barry, Ellen White says, we can see that, that this is, what happened on to the disciples at Pentecost? When did the latter rain get poured out at Pentecost? Because that was the latter rain, right? Pentecost. Acts chapter two. Was that the former rain or the latter rain? In whose line? Well, let, let's say in the disciples' line, or the line of Christ. 
Wouldn't that be the former rain then? Okay. In the line of Christ itself? So, so Angela is, is along the lines that I'm in, that this is the exhibition of the reception of the former and latter reigns, right? So if we understand that the third angel's message is righteousness by faith and verity, or righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, to get it in the right order, um, we can see that that's because the work of the first, of the former reign and the latter reign was, was effective, right? The former reign did its work and the latter reign did its work. Now, getting back to, to the line of Christ, um, why would we argue that the former reign is uh, Acts chapter two? Wouldn't that be only the former reign if we're looking at the bigger line of the, of a, a bigger line where the latter reign is Millerite history and the former reign is the time of Christ? Now, we know that the times are refreshing. So what's the times of refreshing? That's Acts chapter 3, 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So if we're going to put the times of the refreshing, I mean, that's not going to be Acts chapter 2, right? That's going to be something that's going to happen later. Are they going to have a harvest with um, the Holy Spirit being poured out on Acts chapter 2? Yeah, there is a harvest, right? So, so we can take this um, and... And we can apply this to the idea that this is the latter reign in that history. But right away, Peter understands that there is another latter reign. That the latter reign comes again. So if we look at Millerite history, the second angel's message is the latter reign. And so is the angel of Revelation 18, the latter reign. Because don't we have the first sprinklings of the latter rain come at 9-11? Wouldn't that be the latter rain? So if the former rain comes and the latter rain comes prior to the arrival of the third angel, but the latter rain comes again in connection with the empowerment of the third angel, then what Angela is saying makes sense. Can we see that? It's the exhibition of the reception of the former and latter reigns. That it always follows the harvest, always follows the latter rain. Do we have a harvest after October 22nd, 1844? When the third angel arrives. We, we really don't, do we? After 1844, you said? Yeah, we don't have something that parallels what happened with the midnight cry. That's going to be in the future. No. Right. No, you have everybody leaving. <laughs> the opposite. Right. So, so we have three angels' messages, but we only have two reigns, the former and the latter. But the latter reign is going to be repeated. You can see that in the story of Acts because they really received the latter rain 
in Acts chapter 2. But then in Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter's going to direct us to the times of refreshing. Right? And those times of the refreshing are the latter rain that are going to come in the future. So Peter understands this, that what happened in a sense in Acts chapter two is typical of something that's gonna happen in the future. So he in a sense understands that there are different lines. Does that make sense to people? Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And, and this fits in, as we will see, with, with how we understand this history that happened in Millerite history, or not Millerite history, in, in the 1888 period, in this history, in Adventist history. Okay, so, um, so what is the latter reign in connection with the fall of Babylon? It is the bestowal of that power and that glory with which the angel of Revelation 18 comes down and lightens the earth. So we know that Babylon is fallen, right? That's the me message of Revelation 18. So he's, he's going to be examining this a bit more from, from a different perspective than, than what we have, but it's still correct. Now let us read a few passages of those that we have had already to get the connection here definitely. On page 58 of the bulletin, in Brother Haskell's lesson, we had, as it was read from the review of November 22, these words. The time of test is upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. This is the beginning of the light of the third angel, whose glory shall fill the whole earth. Another passage on page 16 of the bulletin in that testimony was read. Yet the work will be cut short in righteousness. What work will be cut short in righteousness? God's work. So, so let's again look at this. So we're so familiar with this passage in the spirit of prophecy that we sometimes don't really listen to what it's saying. So the time of test is just upon us. So what is the time of test? Is he not referring to the Sunday law? Yeah. So this is what Jones is saying all the time. The time of test is just upon us. And he says, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. That's the 1888 message. So now the loud cry of the third angel, we know, hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but Ellen White's saying it had already begun in this message of the third angel. So the third angel's message is about a revelation of the righteousness of Christ. In order to have a revelation of the righteousness of Christ, do you not need first the former reign and then the latter reign? Yeah, I think so, yeah, former reign. Yeah. So Ellen White says, this is the beginning of the light of the third angel, whose glory shall fill the whole earth. Right? So that work of the Holy Spirit in the former reign and the latter reign will be manifest in the glory of Christ's character filling the whole earth. So the third angel's message is the fulfillment or the result of the first and second angel's messages. It's the result of the former and the latter reign. Now, it's going to be cut short in righteousness. So we know this is about righteousness. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the world to the other. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. What is this message of Christ's righteousness as we read here before in these other places or read here before in these other places? This is the beginning of the light of the third angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. Now, this is the glory which closes the work of the third angel. Then when we have come to that time, what time we have reached. 
congregation says the loud cry of the message. We have reached the time when God is going to close it up. That is the glory that closes the work of the message. And one thing we see here is that you can't have the Sunday law test until you have the loud cry. Right? You can't put the cart before the horse. If we're saying that the Sunday law is coming immediately, but we haven't give them, given the loud cry, we're giving a false message. Because we're not in in shape as a people. We haven't produced the righteousness of Christ. And so we can't expect the test to come. Lots of other things, you know, that have to happen as well. But just from the simple point of looking at our characters, we know that we're not prepared for a Sunday law. And we're not going to be prepared for a Sunday law by just saying that the Sunday law is coming. Because the Sunday law comes as a response to the character of Christ in his people. We have reached the time when God is going to close it up. That is the glory that closes the work of the message. Now, another thing, what is that first expression which we have just read? He will cut it short in righteousness. Then when that message of God's righteousness, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, God's right doing, when that is received and is allowed to be carried on and is held by his people, what does that mean about the work of God on the earth? It will be but a short time until the whole thing is done. Then when we reach the time of the latter rain, the loud cry, the angel coming down from heaven, having that great power, all these things coming together, as thus stated by the words of the Lord, we are simply brought to the same point where we were brought by the study of the things which are before us and which led us to view what is coming upon us. That line of study that we had, studying the things that are before us to see what is soon to come upon us, led us face to face with six or seven different events that shut us up to this very thing, that now is the time that the work will be closed up shortly, and we are in the midst of the scenes that close up this world's history. Here are these different expressions in the testimony of the Spirit of God, when put together, that show that it is the same thing from that side. Well, the latter rain is the loud cry of the third angel's message. It is beginning... It is the beginning of that message of glory that lightens the earth. But the latter rain is the teaching of righteousness. When did that message of righteousness of God as such come to us as a people? The congregation says four years ago. Where? Um, at Minneapolis. Yes. This point was brought up in the... Uh, up the other night and can be read again in bulletin number seven, page 183. I do not know that we can state it any more clearly than we did that night. Now that message of the righteousness of Christ is the loud cry. It is the latter rain. We have been praying for the latter rain here at the conference already, haven't we? Have you? So here, now Jones had, had really plainly shown that the message is closed up in righteousness. But we can see that the loud cry is the second angel's message, right? Because it's the second angel's message that joins the third angel's message. So if he's saying that the righteousness of Christ is the loud cry, I mean, this is the loud cry of the third angel, but it's also the loud cry of the second angel, correct? Agreed. Okay. Because we see this in Millerite history. Their midnight cry comes under the second angel's message. So the latter rain comes to empower the third angel's message. And this third angel's message is righteousness by faith and verity is the third angel's message. Because it's now accomplished its work. So we've been praying for the latter rain here at the conference already, haven't we? Have you? Congregation says, yes, sir. 
What were you looking for when your prayer was answered? Are you ready now to receive the latter rain? We've been praying here for the latter rain. Now, there is the connection. The testimonies tell us what it is, and Joel tells us what it is. I simply ask you, are you ready to receive the latter rain? That is, are you ready to receive God's message of righteousness according to righteousness? Let us look at that a little further. Joel says, according to the margin, that it is a teacher of righteousness, which brings the teaching of righteousness according to righteousness. Whose idea of righteousness? Congregation, God's. No, mine. Congregation, no. Yes, mine will do. Congregation says no. Why? If I receive the righteousness of Christ, according to my idea, is, that, is not that enough? Is not that receiving the latter rain? Is not that receiving the righteousness of Christ? The congregation says, no, sir, it is your own righteousness. But that is what is the matter with a good many people who have heard this message of the righteousness of Christ. They have received the message of righteousness of Christ according to their own idea of what his righteousness is. And they have not the righteousness of Christ at all. Now, let us ask again, how are we to see that? to receive that how is it how is that to be given according to righteousness how then is it to be received according to righteousness it is given according to righteousness and we must receive it according to righteousness we must receive it as it is given but let us further dwell further upon that thought and i am in no hurry to get away from it either when we receive the teaching that teaching of righteousness, according to righteousness, which is not according to our ideas of righteousness, God's ideas. We must receive it according to God's idea of righteousness and not according to our own measure of it, right? He who thinks of receiving that message of Christ's righteousness according to his own idea of it will miss it entirely. We are to receive it according to God's idea of it and nothing else than God's idea of righteousness. Nothing, nothing else than that is righteousness. Now, I mean, Jones is going to go into this a little bit more, but why do we have our own ideas of righteousness? Because our minds are dull and fallen and stupid, speaking mainly of myself. Okay. Well, don't we want to appear righteous? I mean, not just to other people, but to ourselves. Doesn't everybody have a sense, this, this idea that we need to... Yeah, be... we want to we feel righteous. Yeah. So, so a hardened criminal in prison, is he, does he consider himself a good guy? Not the ones I've seen. You know ones that don't think they're good guys? That they have, you know, some Charles idea. Man Charles they, Manson thought he was a good guy. <laughs> yeah, well, there are people who believe, you know, even though they, they have no evidence of, of all at all, that they have some sort of, of idea that they are good in some way. They might know they did something illegal. They might even consider themselves bad guys in the sense of, you know, they're mean, they're tough, and all these types of things. But in their own minds, they're going to justify their actions. I killed that guy for a good reason, right? He was going to kill me if I didn't kill him, whatever it is. We're always going to justify our actions. And so the reason why we have our own idea of righteousness is we want to appear righteous in our own eyes. We haven't submitted to Christ's righteousness, to God's idea of righteousness. And so we can look at ourselves and think we're all right. And we can look at our brothers and sisters and judge them according to our idea of righteousness. And they're not going to look all right. 
because they're going to have things that are higher than our level of righteousness. And we're going to see in our brethren things that condemn us. And of course, those things are going to be interpreted in a negative sense. So somebody's doing righteousness, he's manifesting Christ's character, and we're going to judge them as all kinds of things, right? We're going we're gonna to have some way in which we look at what they're doing and decide they're doing it for this reason or that reason. We will impute motives to them that actually don't exist. They're judgmental or whatever it is. But yet all they're doing is acting in accordance with God's righteousness. <clears throat> okay, Jones goes on. There is a thought again that we had the other night that when it was presented four years ago and all along since some have accepted it just as it was given and were glad of the news that God had righteousness that would pass the judgment and would stand accepted in his sight, a righteousness that is a good deal better than anything that people could manufacture by years and years of hard work. People had worn out their souls almost trying to manufacture a sufficient degree of righteousness to stand through the time of trouble and meet the Savior in peace when he comes. But they had not accomplished it. They were so glad to find out that God had already manufactured a robe of righteousness and offered it as a free gift to everyone that would take it that would answer now and in the time of the plagues and in the time of the judgment and to all eternity, that they received it gladly, just as God gave it, and heartily thanked the Lord for it. Others would not have anything to do with it at all, but rejected the whole thing. Others seemed to take a middle position. They did not fully accept it, but neither did they openly reject it. They thought to take a middle position and go along with the crowd if the crowd went that way, and that is the way they hoped uh, to receive the righteousness of Christ and the message of the righteousness of God. Others deliberately discounted the message, about 50%, and counted that the righteousness of God. And so all the way between open and free deliberate surrender and acceptance of it to open, deliberate, and positive rejection of it, all the way between, the compromisers have been scattered ever since. And those who have taken the compromising position are no better prepared tonight to discern what is the message of the righteousness of Christ than they were four years ago. Some of these brethren, since the Minneapolis meeting, have heard myself say amen to preach. I have heard say myself say amen to preaching to statements that were utterly heathen and did not know that did not know but that it was the righteousness of christ so let's read that sentence again i didn't some of these brethren since the minneapolis meeting i have heard myself say amen to preaching to statements that were utter, utterly heathen and did not know but that it was the righteousness of christ so they're going to take heathen statements and believe that it was the righteousness of Christ. That's how I'm taking it, that statement. Some of those who stood so openly against it at that time, right? So um, and I'm not sure if I'm getting this right still. I've heard myself say, oh man, to preaching. To statements that were utterly heathen and did not know, but that it was the righteousness of Christ. Okay, anyway, I don't quite understand that sentence. But anyway, some of those who stood so openly against that at that time and voted with uplifted hands with uplifted hand against it and since that time i've heard say amen to statements that were openly and decidedly papal as the papal church itself can state them that i shall bring in here in one of these state these lessons and call your attention to the catholic church's statement and her doctrine of justification by faith i shall bring that in at some future lesson I will let you see what the doctrine of the Catholic Church is as to justification by faith. I says one, I didn't know that the Catholic Church believes in justification by faith. Oh, yes, she does. Yes, indeed, she does. You can read it out of her books. Says one, I thought they believed in justification by works. They do, and they do not believe in anything else. 
but they pass it off under the head of justification by faith. And they're not the only people in the world that are doing it. I mean, the members of the Catholic Church. They're not the only ones that are doing it. So I appeal to all to just let us come together now and let us lay aside everything, every preconceived notion, every thought of just how this or that opinion is or should be, and come together now to hear the message of the righteousness of Christ and study it in the fear of God, praying with all the heart that he may, in this conference, give us the teacher of righteousness according to his own idea of righteousness. That is what we want. And brethren, as certainly as we pray for him to do that, that is what he will do. And then when he sends us by his spirit, the teaching of the message of his righteousness, let us take it exactly as he gives it and do not discount it a particle. No difference if it takes away all that we ever thought was the right idea in that connection. We have nothing to do with that. We agreed at the beginning of this institute, when we came here to study, to stand upon this platform, that if any one of us thought we knew anything, we knew nothing as we ought to know it. That is applicable to this subject, to those who have received it, just as certainly, though not in the same degree perhaps, as those who have not received it. But because those who have received it, it cannot boast, cannot boast now and stand up and say, I am all right now, I do not need to learn anything new or anything now. If anyone gets into that position, he is the one who needs most to learn of anyone. So what you and I want to do is lay aside every thought of this kind, every deduction that we have made upon it, every discount we have put upon it, every shape we have given to it. Drop all these and let us come, as Christ said, as little children, asking what is the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. These that will not receive the kingdom of God as little children, Jesus himself says, cannot enter into it. And if we come with what we have already learned and try to frame it upon that, it will not fit upon that. If we come and try to mold everything else that we um everything else that he will give us now upon our conception of what we have, we will spoil the whole thing and just shut ourselves out from it all. Therefore, that text abides with us still. If any man thinketh he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. That belongs to us. Now, taking that thought a little further, the latter rain, this message, is the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. That is the loud cry. But that message is the teaching of righteousness according to righteousness. And that means God, I, God's idea of righteousness and not our own. Is my idea of God's righteousness, my idea at its broadest stretch, is that God's idea of righteousness? The congregation says no. Then when I get the broadest idea I can possibly I possibly can of God's righteousness and I'm satisfied with that and say that that is to save me, then whose righteousness is it that is to save me? Congregation, your own. Of course it is. So, so think about this. So even if I it is my idea of God's righteousness, right? So you, you have to look at this in its broadest stretch. Is that the God's idea of righteousness? And we have to say no. So if we have an idea of righteousness in the, in the broadest stretch, it's not God's idea of righteousness. Because can we comprehend God's righteousness? Can we understand what God's righteousness is? I would have to say no. God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest human thought can reach. Right? Yes. And that ideal is the righteousness of God. 
It's not some lower form of righteousness that God has as an ideal for us, right? God doesn't just have an ideal of what he's to be and then this ideal of what humanity is to be. Would we agree with that? That that ideal that God has for his children that's higher than the highest human thought can reach must be the righteousness of God. So even if we can get our broadest idea of God's righteousness and we think that that's going to save us, it's not going to save us because it's our own idea of righteousness. Because when I measure up his ideas and mine and make him like myself, I can find him within my comprehension. And I am my own savior because that makes him no greater than I am. Do you see that? congregation agrees yes indeed we are to receive this message this latter rain this righteousness of god according to his own ideas and in his own way and when he says it when he gives it we are to take up and thank him for it not to question how it comes or anything of the kind but to receive it as he speaks it now um I don't know how far we're going to get here today, but I want to just look at something that he's saying here. So if God is going to give us a righteousness that we can't even conceive of, he's going to do it in his own way. But has God told us what his way is by which we receive the righteousness of Christ? He has, has he not? Okay, and what is that? Is it not the cross? Amen. Okay. So it's impossible to receive the righteousness of Christ without the cross. Because if I live, that is, if I am not dead with Christ, if I did not die with Christ, I'm still alive, right? And if I'm still alive, I will only produce my own righteousness. So I have to die. And then I can be resurrected with Christ. Correct? Correct. Now, now what about our lines? What about this movement? What about the history that we have been passing through as a movement? Is this movement, is this three-step testing prophetic message, that's the everlasting gospel, is it the cross? I don't think so. Okay, well, does this message present the cross? Yes. Okay, so that's what I mean by is it the cross. So each of us, in receiving this message, is receiving a message that requires a cross. It goes contrary to our nature. Now, if we have a line, if we create a line and we create a message that, that is in accordance with our nature, is it a cross? Can we see that the messages that were given by those that left the movement, the messages that were given by people like Parminder were removing the cross, that it was our own ideas of righteousness that we needed to receive, right? I mean, I saw it in the people who received Parminder's message in 2017, who believed that they now had received the righteousness of Christ. One of the brothers, he said, he's perfect. He doesn't sin anymore. Had he received the righteousness of Christ? Absolutely not. No. He, just, he had just received his own idea of righteousness 
and lived up to that idea of righteousness. He was one of the worst people that I met while at the School of the Prophets. I mean, there was some pretty bad people, but he was one who was totally oblivious to any of his character defects. And the fact that he could even think, let alone speak, or maybe the other way, speak or let alone think, that he was righteous was a total self-deception on his part. Now, some aren't so bold to speak it, but they definitely act it. And they act it in how they treat one another. In the cruelty that they have towards those who are who don't agree with them or don't agree with their feelings or sentiments or ideas. And we know that if, if somebody is cruel to somebody who differs, that they don't have the righteousness of Christ because was Christ cruel to those that differed? Didn't he die for them? Didn't he give up his life? Didn't he present the gospel? Didn't he labor? Yes. Okay. And so if a person doesn't do those things, no matter how much he professes to believe in righteousness, he's not righteous. He might be righteous in his own eyes, and he can judge other people according to his ideas of righteousness. But he's not converted. Unless he's converted, he cannot be saved. So, um, so this is, this is a problem that we have because we have our own idea of righteousness. We judge other people based on our idea of righteousness. And we are doing the work of the accuser of the brethren. While we profess to love God, but he that loves God and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And if you do not love your brother who you have seen, you cannot like love Christ who you have not seen. These are simple, basic ideas. Now, we can see that our lines then have brought us to the experience of the cross all along the line. Because are not the way marks righteousness? Are not the way marks the plumb? They should be. Yeah. And every time we come to those, one of those way marks, we see a cross. And do we take up our cross daily and die? Or do we fall away because we're unwilling to bear that cross? But to receive it, the righteousness of Christ as he speaks it, as he gives it, and let him do just as he pleases in carrying forward the work uh, forward to the world. Because what is righteousness? It is right doing. Whose righteousness is it that we are to have? God's. Then it is God's right doing that we are to have, not our own idea of right doing, right? Because our own right doing is just our own idea of right doing. It is his idea of his right doing and not our own idea of right doing. It is not our idea of his right doing. It is his own idea of his own right doing. It is, in fact, his own right doing when he does things. Therefore, that calls upon you and me to yield up everything of ourselves and let him do the doing as he pleases with this which is his own. He is to do the doing. We are to be instruments. Yield yourselves as instruments of righteousness. Your members as instruments of righteousness. Yield them to whom? To God. He uses the instruments, Romans 6.13. Will he let him? Will you let him? The congregation says, yes, sir. Will you stick to that for a week? The congregation says, yes, sir. Now, another thought that leads us thus. We know it is God's idea only that is the true idea of righteousness of God, of this righteousness of God, then can I grasp his idea of righteousness with my own mind? So we already discussed this. 
Congregation says, no, sir. Can I have a mind that will grasp it and that can grasp it? Yes. Is there any mind in the universe that can grasp God's idea of righteousness? Yes. Whose? Christ's. Then does not that shut you and me up to the fact that without the mind of Jesus Christ, we have not and cannot have the righteousness of God? I care not how much of a theory a man may have of the righteousness of God. I care not how much he may say he believes in the righteousness of God. I care not how much he may say he believes in justification by faith. If he has not the mind of Christ itself, he does not understand God's idea of justification by faith, and he cannot tell it. No man can grasp the idea of the righteousness of God without the mind of Christ, which alone of all minds in the universe can grasp grasp it or comprehend it or know it. No, that is so. Congregation says, yes, sir. But I can have my mind turned into the mind of Christ. Can't I? Remade, revamped, and transformed into the mind of Christ? Congregation says, no, sir. Someone in the audience quoted the text, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. All right. Will you let it? Will you do that? Is that what you have made up your mind to do? Congregation says, yes, sir. That is the thing to start with, then, is it not? Let us get that clear. And I think that by that time, the hour for this the study this evening will be expired, that the only possible way in which anybody in this world can know the righteousness of God, can receive the righteousness of God, can receive the teaching of this righteousness according to righteousness. The only way, the only possible way that any man in this world can receive it or know it is by having the mind of Christ itself. Here is an expression we will give, correct enough in itself, that the commandments of God are the reflection, the transcript, the expression of God's righteousness. The Ten Commandments are the manifestation in writing, in letters, of the will of God, Romans 2, 17 and 18. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest not, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Then the law being an expression of God's will that expresses what is God's will that shall be done in the way of right doing? Will the Ten Commandments accept any doing from anybody that comes short of God's idea of what is right doing? No. Then the Ten Commandments simply require such a measure of right doing as God owned, owns God's own mind measures, as his will expresses. Well, then, when the Ten Commandments require just that, and will accept nothing short of that. How in the world are the requirements of the Ten Commandments to be met in any man's life in this world who has not the mind of God? It cannot be done. Where do we get that mind? Congregation, in Christ. Then is it possible for any man, by any possible means, to render to the Ten Commandments what they require and what only they will accept without having the mind of Christ itself. The congregation says, no, sir. Well, can I have the mind of Christ without the rest of him? No, I cannot. Therefore, as I cannot have the mind of Christ without the rest of him, it follows that I must have the personal presence of Jesus Christ himself. And what is it that brings to you and me the personal presence of Jesus Christ, the spirit of God, Turn to two texts, one in John and one in Ephesians. And I think that we will be all we will have time to read tonight. John 14, verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He does not leave us comfortless. That is without a comforter. So he says, I will come to you. But when he comes to us thus, we are not without a comforter. Then he does come to us by the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. Now turn to Ephesians 3, 16 and 17. Let us read carefully together. This is the prayer. 
that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Someone quoted the words of the text by faith. Of course, faith belongs there, but there is a double attachment to the middle statement. First, strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. But he dwells in the heart by faith. We receive the promise of the spirit through faith. But what brings it? The spirit of God. And when we have that, Christ dwells in the heart then it is the Holy Spirit that brings the personal presence of Jesus Christ. And in bringing his personal presence to us, he brings himself. Then it is the mind of Christ by which we may comprehend, investigate, and revel in the deep things of God, which he reaches down and brings forth to our understanding and sets them before us in their plainness. That is what we ha must have in order to have the presence of Christ, in order to have the righteousness of Christ, in order that we may have the latter rain, in order that we may give the loud cry. So <clears throat> we can see here that um, Jones has it right, that there is this righteousness of Christ and that righteousness can only be found in Christ. And for us to perform that righteousness, we must have the mind of Christ because our mind cannot conceive what the righteousness of Christ is, God's idea of righteousness. Now, when it comes to receiving the mind of Christ, how do we receive it? I mean, in, in a very practical sense. Because we're sinners, we don't have the mind of Christ. How do we receive the mind of Christ? We seek it. We, we do what? We seek it through his spirit. Okay, we seek it. Okay. So, so we know that there is, that God wants to give us his mind. He wants to give us his righteousness. Christ wants us to be righteous. He can't save us without making us righteous, because that's actually what he does. He saves his people from their sins, not just from the act, the, the consequence of sin, but from sin itself. Right. He restores man into the image of of God with which man was originally created. We we're made in God's image. So we need to be restored into that image. But it's a very difficult thing for us to understand because when we look at how we want to become righteous, we, we tend to put our own ideas of righteousness in the way. And, and I know Jones has a difficult time trying to get this idea across, but I mean, on, in a very simple sense, we experience a cross every day, do we not? Because we, we seek to follow God and God's will and way is going to be at crossroads with our will and way, correct? Yes. Okay. And so we have to take up our cross in the very little things that happen to us each day. Now, we may not know what's going on, but is <clears throat> we're not thinking as we're doing these little things that God is showing us each moment. I'm, I understand the righteousness of God, and, and I'm righteous because I did these little things. But don't those little things each day, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us and tells us what the right thing is, and we do it, even though we don't understand it, is this not taking up your cross daily? Are we yoking up with Christ? Are we learning in the school of Christ? 
And if we take up the cross daily, will we not be able to be strengthened? Will our characters not be transformed? Because we can't expect that when we first take up our, our cross, that we are that we have crucified self completely. Right? Agreed. And we know that we have to die daily. We have to bear about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Because we don't have righteousness in and of ourselves. That righteousness only comes from the cross of Christ. And in order to, have to take up the cross of Christ, we have to respond to what light God gives us. And that can be often very little things. We always want to have these big things, right? We want to see ourselves being victorious. We put before us some test. You know, I need to overcome this big sin. And yet God puts little things in front of us each day to strengthen us. You know, I don't think there's an Olympic athlete who just one day decided he's going to be in, in the Olympics and just lifted the record amount of weight. We would need to train, would we not? How could we not? Yes, we would have to train. And, and when we yoke up with Christ, when we come to Christ, when light comes into the darkness and reaches our hearts and we see that we're a sinner, God doesn't show us everything that has to change. He just asks us to let him in. He knocks at the door of our heart. And we have to remove the rubbish in the way so that he can come in and that he can cleanse us from sins, from sin itself. Because we don't know and fully understand the righteousness of Christ, but the righteousness of Christ is always being offered to us. And it's being offered to us always with a cross. It can't be possibly be offered to us without a cross. Can we see that? Yeah, because our nature is at enmity with him. Right. So, I mean, if, if it's not a cross, it's not righteousness, right? It has to be at odds with our nature. And so every time we seek to follow God, a cross is presented. And it's presented in the little things in day-to-day -day life. It's not some big thing. We don't just go and lift, you know, 500 pounds over our heads. We have little things. We have to pick up small things. We have to be strengthened with God's might, with his character. Because what, what is being asked of us is impossible of ourselves. We can't even conceive of the righteousness in Christ of the righteousness of Christ, let alone can we even in the slightest approach it on our own. Because we're at enmity with God. We are, we are the exact opposite of righteousness. We are unrighteous. And we have to be transformed. So this, this is a difficult thing because we always seem to believe that we are righteous, even if we're not. The only way that we know we're not righteous is by the Holy Spirit bringing us a, a conviction, showing us that we are not righteous. We can't know this in and of ourselves. That's why the most vilest person can still justify their actions. Because they don't have the Holy Spirit bringing a conviction. They have shut out the Holy Spirit. They shut out the light. Now, we look at the most vilest person, but really aren't we the most vilest person? 
Is there any difference from the most hardened criminal than from us? There isn't levels of righteousness. Either we are righteous or we are not. And when the Holy Spirit comes to us, do, not we, do we not see ourselves in this conviction? We see how far we are from God's nature, how far we are from God. The cl closer we come to Christ, the more sinful we appear in our own eyes. So wouldn't somebody who's a Christian have a much greater appreciation of his sinfulness than somebody who has no interest in God at all? Green. So if we're going to give the loud cry, if we're talking about us, sinful, vile human beings, being entrusted with a message, the everlasting gospel, we can only do this if we have the mind of Christ. There's no way that we can give the gospel, the everlasting gospel, without the mind of Christ. Doesn't matter how intellectual we are, how much we understand about the message. We can understand the lines, we can understand chronology, we can see things. But if we don't have the character of Christ, if we don't have the mind of Christ, we're none of His. We're not in Christ. And this is the message that Jones gave. And I remember this, this sermon very well. Because it, it struck me at exactly where I needed to be struck. And it does so still today. Maybe even strikes me more. And it, it's my hope that it strikes you as well. That you can see that we're very far from the righteousness of Christ. That we have nothing whereof to boast. Nothing where we can look down upon our brethren. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this message from the past. When the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down, but was rejected, we ask Lord that in our time, that we cannot reject this message. We need you. We ask for forgiveness for our sins. We ask that you can forgive us for our self-righteousness, for our critical and judging attitude of others. And we pray, Lord, that this message that you have been giving us to heal us, that we can receive it so that it, we can give it to others and that they can see it worked out in our lives, that they can see you instead of us. Help us to trust that you can do these things in us. Be with each person on this Sabbath. We ask for your special blessing. We pray for the meeting uh, tomorrow morning and the one in the afternoon as we continue this study. We know, Lord, that... Um, you are speaking to our hearts. Give us an ear to hear. Help us to accept this message to the Laodicean that we are. We pray and we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.